Welcome back to the last of our learning theories. I almost always save this one for last. It's called social cognitive theory. It's kind of fun and practical. It's certainly an interesting theory. Basically, we're going to be looking at the assumptions of this theory, what are its main principles, and we're going to be seeing how can we use this in the classroom. As an FYI, I do want to point out that this theory goes by a lot of alternative names, so you may see it listed elsewhere, even in other textbooks, under different names, like observational learning. So, what is this theory about? Social cognitivists define learning as how we observe other people's behavior as well as their consequences. So this is very different from the other theories that we have seen, which believe that you learn only when you are hands-on, like constructivism, or you learn only by discussing with other people, like social constructivism, or through rewards and consequences. This one says you learn just by watching. You can sit in a corner and quietly learn. The origins of social cognitive theory begin with Albert Bandura in the 60s. He was working out of Stanford University, and he's most famous for what's called the Bobo doll study, which we're going to see video of in just a moment. So, for this famous study, children were put into one of two groups. One group saw adults playing nicely with toys on a video. The other group saw adults playing aggressively with toys. Then the children were put in rooms and observed. The uh, model pummeled the doll with a mallet, flung it in the air. Now this is the video that the children saw in the experimental group. This was considered to be aggression in the 60s. Oh, it's so harsh. Shield my eyes. <laughs> and now here are the actual kids after they watched that video. And you can see them imitating some of what they saw. It was once widely believed that seeing others vent aggression would drain the viewer's aggressive drive. As you can see, exposure to aggressive modeling is hardly cathartic. Mm -hmm. And the children did copy the same behaviors, the same language. And there were other toys exposure in the room, to too. Aggressive modeling increased attraction to guns even though it was never modeled. Guns had less appeal to children who had no exposure to the aggressive modeling. The children also picked up the novel hostile language. And it just kind of goes on, and obviously this kid wasn't the only subject, but they saw the same results over and over. And again, there were other toys in the room, but they chose to imitate what they saw. So I think you get the point. The results of this study allowed Bandura to prove that children's aggression actually increased after watching adults behave aggressively. This was in direct opposition to the theory of the day, which was catharsis theory, the idea that if you watched an aggressive movie, you would leave feeling less aggressive. He actually replicated these studies over and over, showing that in fact watching aggression on TV makes us more aggressive. Let's take a look at the basic assumptions of social cognitive theory, meaning if you are a social cognitivist, what do you believe in? First of all, their basic description of how we learn. 
that we can learn simply by observing. You can sit quietly in the corner of the classroom and still learn. So keep in mind how different that is from both Piaget and Vygotsky, who say you have to learn by doing something. Piaget says you have to actively interact with something, an object, and Vygotsky saying you have to interact with a person. Bandura is saying, hmm, you don't have to interact at all. You can just sit there and watch. In fact, ask yourself the question, have you ever learned anything this way? Again, just by watching someone. Hmm, I can think of a lot of examples. Children might learn how to do chores by watching their mom and dad around the house. Uh, this is how we learn many of our subject areas. In fact, if you're teaching a physical skill, such as physical education, children learn by observing you as you demonstrate what to do. Think about all the cooking shows out there based mm -hmm. on the belief that you can learn how to cook by watching someone else do it well. Or what about YouTube and Pinterest? Again, there are many uh, sources of evidence out there to show that yes, we do learn simply by observing. Next mm -hmm. is a short video that shows how you can even see social cognitive theory in animals. So of course, you know I love cats. So this little kitten here is watching its mom clean itself. And that's how it's learning how to clean itself. <laughs> Let's continue with our assumptions. The second one is that learning is influenced by motivation and cognition. So what does this mean? This means that we don't uh, imitate everything we see. We have to actually want to do it. We have to be motivated to do it and we actually think about it. So we imitate behavior that relates to our goals. It has to be something that fits us and something that we want to do. I really like this phrase in connection to this theory. I'm sure you've all heard monkey see, monkey do. That is not what social cognitive theory is about. Social cognitive theory says monkey see and monkey may or may not choose to do that we don't blindly imitate. We think about things and we choose appropriately. Moving along, our next basic assumption brings reinforcement and punishment into this theory. But social cognitivists believe that it has an indirect influence. So what does that mean, indirect? In operant conditioning, the way it worked was you had to be rewarded. You had to be punished in order to learn. Here it's very different. You don't have to be rewarded. You only have to see someone else get rewarded. That's the difference. So. We are more likely to imitate someone if we see them get rewarded and we're less likely if we see them get punished. The reason the word is indirect is because I myself don't have to get rewarded or punished. I only have to see it happen to someone else. This is called vicarious learning. That's the specific term to explain what this phenomena is. So here is a video showing that Bandura looked at vicarious learning as well. So he did a version of the Bobo doll study to look at vicarious learning. This is not actual footage from the study, but this is a YouTube recreation performed by psychology students. Here it's showing you that there were a variety of different um, types of aggression that the kids saw. And you can hear the novel hostile language.
All right, so for one group, they just saw the aggression. That was it, just like the first study. The other two groups, though, got to see a consequence, a reward or a punishment. That's the reward <laughs> or the punishment. <laughs> then they put the children in the room just like they did before to see what they did. They had a variety of toys, including the... Let's take a look at the results the of this particular study because it is quite interesting. So, compare boys and girls. Boys are in blue, girls are in pink. And the oh. difference between when the model was rewarded and the model was punished. I'm going to hit pause. Obviously, my colors are off. Boys are in green, girls are in pink. So, again, if you're comparing what happened between the, whether the model was rewarded or punished, you can see here boys are this lighter column, here's the change in green. Girls are the darker columns, here's the change in blue. What this indicates is girls are more affected by punishment. Okay, girls like to avoid punishment more. So you can see when they saw the model get punished, they were way less likely to imitate the behavior. Boys were less likely, but not as much. You can see that they each showed a decrease. If the model was punished, they were less likely to imitate. You can also see that that difference is bigger for girls. Study after study show that girls take punishment more seriously and are more likely to try to avoid being punished. Now, there are some other things you can see in this study. Uh, so if the boys are the lighter column, and the girls are the darker column, who was more likely to imitate the aggressive behavior? The boys were. Now, what we know about gender difference, that makes sense. If instead of looking at aggressive behavior, you were looking at something more typical for girls, they might have imitated it more. And here's something that's interesting. If there's no consequence, when the model didn't get punished or rewarded, compare this to the reward. It's almost the same. So think about all those cartoons that kids watch where there are aggressive acts and nobody goes to jail, nobody gets punished. You know, Wiley e. Coyote, how many times does he try to kill the roadrunner and he never gets punished? That is almost the same thing as rewarding the model in terms of likelihood for imitation. So here's a question to ponder. As a future teacher, how can we use vicarious learning? Well, it's actually quite common. Think about a common scenario. You have a student in class using their cell phone. If you apply your consequences well, and you go over and you confiscate that phone, everyone in the classroom observed that. And although not every student was punished, only one or two students received the consequence, everyone has just learned what will happen if they pull out a phone. Here's a brief video of how you can use peer modeling in the classroom uh, along with vicarious learning. Camille's got that right, exactly. I like the way Jeremy is sitting so quietly because he knows that it's time to sit quietly. Amanda, could you join the rest of the group and be right on task? Jeremy's working hard and Ginger is. You can do it too. I'm counting on you. All right, so we know then that... Let's go to our next assumption, that learning only creates a potential. Well, that is a word we have not covered yet, the idea of learning as a potential. That means you can learn something, you can keep it in your head and store it and decide whether or not you want to imitate that behavior. Well, that really does not go along with Piaget or Vygotsky who talk about learning by doing things hands-on. You do it in order to learn it. Behaviorists who talk about how the only way we know that you've learned is by demonstrating it. But this is the idea that 
you could watch video after video about how to cook something, like how to cook ribs. And you might know in your head how to do that, but might not ever actually cook that. That learning can be, again, a potential that's stored away that you decide whether or not, when or if, you're going to use that knowledge. Our last assumption is looking at developmental differences. That as we grow, our behavior becomes more self-regulated, meaning we are under more control. So we're more likely to choose what it is that we want to do. Whereas younger children become more impressionable. So when you're looking at learning by imitation, younger children are more likely to do this. They're more likely to potentially blindly imitate someone without really thinking about the consequences. Older children are more likely to think about things and decide whether or not they want to imitate. Keeping that in mind, the idea of developmental differences, I think this quote is quite essential. Children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they've never failed to imitate them. And this makes you think of the power that an adult has and how they need to be very careful about what they say and do in front of children, especially younger children. So take this example. This is a pretty common picture of breakfast or practically any meal in an American family. What are the children learning from this? And you can see they are imitating their parents. And so if we don't want our children to grow up staring at their phone, perhaps we need to stop staring at ours as well. This is a short video that I found on YouTube that I think does a nice job of reminding parents about how we need to be careful of what we do and say in front of our children. Now, let's start to see how this applies to the classroom and to instructional strategies. The instructional strategy that is associated with social cognitive theory is called modeling. Modeling is a very simple two-step process. The first step is to demonstrate a behavior. So teachers do this all the time, whether we are demonstrating how to solve a math problem on the chalkboard, how to diagram a sentence, how to set up a chemistry experiment. Here's a short video from a learning vignette project in class where you can see that these students in their presentation are doing the first step of modeling. Then, the second step of modeling is that the students have observed and now are prepared to imitate the behavior. So now they can go back to their lab desk and imitate the chemistry experiment, or they can pull out their sheet of paper and imitate and work on the math problem that was just solved on the board. Here's a short clip from the movie School of Rock, where you can see the students learning through this process of observing and imitating. You play the guitar? Yeah. Okay, come here. 
I'm jumping in because the video wasn't playing quite right, so I'm going to play it in this window now for us. You play the guitar? Yeah. Okay, come here. You ever play the electric guitar? My dad won't let me. He thinks it's a waste of time. A waste of... Try this one. School of Rock is okay. a great movie. Here's a guitar pick. And you pluck along with me, okay? If you can. <laughs> okay, stay right there. Don't move. Just see if you can do what I do, okay? Just give it a try. Okay? Give that a try. Okay! <laughs> so in both instances, <clears throat> perfect example of modeling. Jack Black um, demonstrates and the students imitate. I think it makes sense that our next big question is, who do we imitate? Do we just imitate everyone in our life? Or are there certain individuals who are more likely to look up to and perhaps observe and imitate? Let's begin. So, who are we more likely to imitate? Well, we will start with models who have some form of prestige or power. We're more likely to imitate someone that we actually look up to. So when we're young, this could be our parents. So you'll see young boys picking up tools like their dad, uh, little girls perhaps helping their mom cleaning around the house. You also tend to look up to your teachers. So students will observe and imitate their teachers, which is obviously very helpful for the learning process. You may even have children who look up to individuals in their church and imitate them as well. As children get older, they might also start to look at celebrities or people on TV as those who have some form of prestige or power. Um, I have a silly example to make that point. So Paris Hilton was known for carrying around cute little dogs. Surprisingly, people saw that as something to imitate and it actually became a problem in California because so many girls went out and bought chihuahuas and other small toy dogs, found that they could not take care of them, started surrendering them to shelters, and the shelters were being just overrun with these toy dogs. And to continue that story, to make matters worse, these shelters that were overrun with these toy dogs could not take care of all of them, and all these chihuahuas were lined up to be euthanized. So to save these dogs, they started a program of flying them to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a silly example, but it does show the power of imitating those who we see as having some sort of prestige or power. Who else do we imitate? Well, we also imitate those that we see as being somehow similar to us. And typically, this deals with gender and age. This is why little girls tend to imitate their moms. Little boys tend, tend to imitate their dads. And we also do the same when it comes to age. We're more likely to imitate someone that was similar in age to us, or perhaps a little bit older. <laughs> I thought this cartoon was silly yet relevant. You can see how certain fashion trends are even imitated among similar age cohorts. Let's continue with our list. We're also more likely to imitate models who we see as being competent. And that makes sense because we ourselves have a natural desire to want to be competent in what we do. So when we see someone being successful and good at what they do, we're more likely to imitate them. As we continue our list, we'll see that we're also more likely to imitate someone who demonstrates behavior that is somehow relevant to us. And that makes sense. We all have goals. We tend to imitate things that go in accordance with our goals. So if you were to watch two different movies, one about a very competent, successful teacher, and one about a competent, successful astronaut, I bet you can guess which one you're more likely to see yourself imitating. 
Let's relate that to a couple of TV shows that during their time were popular. We have MTV's Jackass and we have Tosh.0. Oh. In both of those shows, you'll notice a warning right before the show starts. And the warning is about copycats telling people not to imitate what they've seen on TV because they've actually had big problems, jackass in particular, with people trying to imitate those stunts and then getting hurt. So legally, they put this up here to try to protect themselves. Well, based on what we know about social cognitive theory, someone like me, I can watch jackass all day and I'm not in any danger of imitating what they do because it's not relevant to me or my life. I don't want to be a YouTube sensation. I don't want to be a daredevil. But uh, a teenager who does perhaps want to be a YouTube sensation or a daredevil is more likely to imitate what they see because that behavior is relevant to them or to their goals. That's what it's basically about. And here's yet another one of my irreverent cartoons, but again, trying to make the point of modeling relevant behavior. Next on our list for who we're likely to imitate, we're also more likely to imitate models who get rewarded for what we do. And I think this makes a lot of sense considering what we've already learned about vicarious learning. When someone gets rewarded, we're more likely to take note and perhaps imitate them. And finally on this list, we're more likely to imitate someone who shows what we call coping or persistence behavior. I'm going to show you on the next slide what I mean by that. Here are some examples of what I mean by a persistence and coping model. These are individuals who have been through adversity and come out successful on the other side. Whether they have persevered through battle, whether they have overcome drugs or lost weight, these are, again, people who have shown their ability to cope and survive and even thrive. Let's take a moment and consider persistent models when it comes to media or advertising or messages. So one big campaign right now is looking at trying to teach people not to text and drive. Here's one campaign that I saw, and it focuses on um, this character from the Cars video. How successful do you think this ad is? Now let's take a look at the ad on the next slide. These ads carry a lot more weight. This is about someone's real personal story and how texting and driving has impacted them personally and their families personally. This type of message is going to be much more meaningful, uh, which is why when you have speakers come to schools to talk about things like drunk driving or use of drugs, you usually bring someone who has that personal experience. To again help us understand how to apply this to the classroom, we need to look at the steps to explain how this can be used and how this occurs in the classroom. All right, I hope you'll see that these steps make a lot of sense. The first step should be pretty obvious, attention. It is absolutely crucial that you have your students' attention since this entire model for learning is based upon observation. The next step is memory. So once a student has observed you, they actually have to be able to retain that information in their short-term memory long enough to perhaps be able to duplicate it. Thirdly, it has to be something that they're capable of. If it is too difficult, they won't be able to imitate it. So it has to be something that is actually within their um, realm of ability, something that they're um, able to imitate. And finally, they have to want to do this. There has to be some source of motivation. So you can use this to diagram a problem. If you're talking with a science teacher who complains that after demonstrating the lab that the students are unable to replicate it once they go back to their station, use these four steps to find where the problem is. Were they paying attention? Are there perhaps too many steps and they're not able to remember them all? Is it too difficult for them? And finally, are they motivated to do it? This can help you solve some of these problems in the classroom. All right, 
Next, we want to take a look at classroom use. These are just basically some teaching tips to help you if you're going to be using social cognitive theory. First and foremost, make sure that you are demonstrating behaviors that are appropriate for your students. Keep in mind that they're going to be watching you, and as they watch you, they're going to be imitating you. So think about the attitude that you present. Uh, you should be demonstrating the type of things that you want to see in your students. Also, when it comes to subject skills, if you're teaching math, make sure you can solve your problems correctly on the board. If you're teaching English, make sure you use proper, proper grammar. This cartoon is obviously relevant to the idea of, you know, wanting to demonstrate appropriate behaviors. All right, this next tip is probably also obvious. You want to make sure that you have your students' attention before modeling. So before you solve that math problem on the board, or show them how to use their paintbrush, or how to solve a chemical equation, they have to be paying attention, or it's not going to work. Next, while you're demonstrating, it is also good to provide verbal description, so that way they're both watching you and hearing you at the same time. They will learn better that way. And think about the variety of models that you have. It does not always have to be you. You can have other students stand up and model something. You can bring in guest speakers or parents or mentors. I think this is a lovely example where Columbus City Schools brought in a police officer to read stories to the kids. And he was also an alumni of the school. Here's a short video from a learning vignette where you can see they had a student stand up and demonstrate as a model, and you can see how the other students are really paying attention, and perhaps more so than they would even if the teacher was demonstrating. So you can see the teachers are up front, and there's a student raising his hand. Now, by the way, that picture right there is from the old McCracken. If you ever wonder what McCracken used to look like, it was pretty run down. Um, but again, yeah, you can see how the students really pay attention when you have another student stand up and demonstrate something. Another teaching tip is to be very thoughtful about the books, the movies, the literary characters that you present to your students and how they might interpret them as role models. And I have some examples on the next page. So when you're thinking about which movies you might want to show in class, let's say you're going to treat your younger students with a Disney movie. Well, women are portrayed very differently in these two movies. In Mulan, you have a woman who wants to fight for her country and protect her family. And in The Little Mermaid, you have a girl that's willing to abandon her whole family and her way of life just to marry the prince of her dreams. Then you have popular teen book series. Um, I, if I had to choose between these two, I would certainly go with Percy Jackson. The Twilight series, there's a lot of research out there about how it is really um, promoting violent relationships and toxic relationships. So again, just to think about the message that is being promoted by these books that your students might be picking up on. And although, yes, I did catch these memes online, I think that they really are telling about Twilight. So him saying, I'll stalk you, manipulate you, physically abuse you, treat you like an incompetent child, and contemplate killing you. While at the same time, she's saying, uh, that's okay, you know, I'm just going to internalize your abuse, and you must be right after all. There are some of these hidden messages within some of these movies that your kids can pick up on. In fact, we're going to end with some potential problems with imitation. Now, the point in this part of the lesson is not to make you think that social cognitive theory is bad. It's to make you think about the importance of looking at what it is that our children are watching and the lessons they might get from it. 
All right, so some of our young boys might grow up watching wrestling. And you might ask yourself, well, what's the harm in that? It's just simply a physical sport. Well, let's look at the next page. Here are just four examples, and believe me, this is not all of them. There were lots and lots of them online of examples of young children trying to imitate the moves that they would see in big time wrestling. And in each instance, there was a fatal consequence. So what about violence on TV, whether we're talking about cartoons or movies or video games? Think about not only the violent images that children see while they're playing these video games, but the fact that they are actually getting to role play, that they're getting to be the person who is holding the gun and doing the shooting. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are lots of examples online of school principals trying to work with and encourage parents not to get their children Grand Theft Auto and other violent video games due to the destructive modeling. This is one interesting study that was looking not only at the children's exposure to violent video games, but also relating it to their own personality. So after looking at personality assessments, the children were put in two categories, low hostility and high hostility. I'm going to hit pause so I can explain this one. So again, based on the personality assessment, some kids, their personality is low for hostility. Some kids, their personality is high for hostility. Um, and then what they did was they looked at their type of video game play. Did they play video games that were low on violence or high on violence? Low on violence, high on violence. Then they looked at the percentage of these students that had been involved in physical fights at school. And you can really see a dramatic difference. So first of all, the big difference is between the low hostile group and the high hostile group, indicating some kids are just simply more likely to be aggressive. But look at the big difference here between whether they played nonviolent games or violent games. 4% to 38%, that is a big jump. So indicating that despite the fact that their personality said they were not um, typically aggressive, they were so much more aggressive when they played aggressive video games. And then when you take the kids that already have an aggressive attitude or an aggressive personality, they are twice as likely to imitate what they're seeing in these games. So I just want you to ponder for a moment, what are your thoughts about this impact? And keep in mind, again, one of those assumptions from social cognitive theory that children are more impressionable when they're younger, which is why we do have that rating system on games, which I think is fairly important. What about music videos? You might think, well, that's harmless as well. It's simply music and dancing. Well, what types of dancing are the children observing? What about the lyrics within those songs? I remember seeing a video on Tosh.0 once where they were showing a kid's birthday party and I was shocked by the way the kids were dancing. And you can tell that they must have gotten these examples from watching something like music videos. And I also hate to point out the parents so, were doing it too. An important point but... I want to make here is that it is not that social cognitive theory is bad. Learning by observation and imitation is a very appropriate and common way of learning. The problem is what it is that you're observing and who it is that you're observing. <laughs> so as parents think about, again, and not just parents, but teachers as well, what is it that our children are watching? And perhaps are there some better examples out there? There are some great websites like Common Sense that can help parents and teachers be a better judge of what shows and movies might be better for our children. And before I say the end, I also want to point out, and I'll make the screen a little bit bigger, this particular learning theory is especially important for any of you who plan on doing skill-based subject areas. So if you're going to be teaching PE, foreign language, art, music, math, some science, um, some writing, all of that, you're going to be using social cognitive theory, and it is a very good and solid approach for teaching students skills. 
you demonstrate appropriately what to do and they imitate. So please don't let that last bit make you feel like this is a bad theory because it's not. It's just again that cautionary tale to make sure that you're providing them with good examples. So that's all and thank you so much for your attention and I'll see you next time.